Good evening, and welcome to tonight's literary conversation about guns and gun violence in literature. I'm Gwydion Sullivan, Penn Faulkner's Executive Director, and I'm particularly glad that we have each other's company tonight as we all try to reckon with the sobering news from Thailand about a horrific mass shooting in a child care center. Thank you all so much for being here. At Penn Faulkner, we celebrate the power of literature to help us engage with the world with nuance and intelligence just when we need them most, like today, like every day, we have books. They connect us to ourselves, to each other, and to ideas and experiences and people from all over the world. Books enrich our lives. You might know Penn Faulkner because we give out the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, the only major literary prize in America given by writers to writers. But we also give out the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Short Story, and we select an annual Penn Faulkner Literary Champion. Last year it was Oprah, and this year it's uh, NPR's Fresh Air host, Terry Gross. But the truth is that about half of what we do is provide author visits and culturally relevant books and writing instruction to students in low-income schools in DC at no cost so that we can inspire the next generation of readers and writers. And of course, we also host virtual literary programs like this one, which are available to everyone everywhere on a pay what you will model. So we can make sure they're accessible even in times of economic fragility. With all of that in mind, I want to say, if you have the means, I hope you'll consider a contribution in support of our mission and programs. We'll drop a link in the chat. So for tonight's program, also to ensure accessibility, we are providing live captioning, which you can toggle on and off by using the CC button below. And we'll be having a Q&A as part of the event, too. And you can use the Q&A button to submit your questions at any time, including now. So now I want to introduce our amazing authors and tonight's really amazing moderator. Jennifer Clement is President Emerita of Penn International, the only woman to hold the office of president since the organization was founded. She's also the author of the novels, A True Story Based on Lies, The Poison That Fascinates, Prayers for the Stolen, which was a Penn Faulkner Award finalist, Gone Love, and Stormy People, as well as several poetry collections and a memoir. She's been the recipient of so many awards, including the Canongate Prize, the Sarah Curry Humanitarian Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and an NEA Fellowship. And her work has been or is being adapted for both film and television. Tony Jensen is the author of Carrie, a memoir of survival on stolen land, a finalist for the Dayton Peace Prize and a New York Times Editor's Choice book. She was an NEA Creative Writing Fellowship recipient in 2020, and her essays have appeared in Orion and Catapult and Ecotone, among others. She is also the author of the story collection From the Hilltop. She teaches at the University of Arkansas and the Institute of American Indian Arts. Tony is Métis. Nick Stone is the author of Dear Martin, a number one New York Times bestselling novel that encourages readers to examine their biases and have honest discussions about race. Her mission is to tell stories that speak to kids underrepresented in YA literature, to create windows in which young people are introduced to new perspectives, and to offer mirrors in which children can see their ideas and experiences uh, and their identities fully represented. In addition to Dear Martin, her books include Dear Justice, Blackout, and Clean Getaway, which are all New York Times bestsellers. And last but not least, our moderator. Lori Edham is the founder of Well-Read Black Girl, a podcast and a digital platform that celebrates the uniqueness of Black literature and sisterhood. And she edited the Well-Read Black Girl anthology in 2018, which was nominated for an NAACP Image Award and named a Best Book of the Year by Library Journal. She was the 2017 winner of the Innovators Award from the LA Times Book Prizes, and she's worked as a cultural practitioner for more than 10 years. 
Lori serves on the board of Baldwin for the Arts and New York City's Housing Works Bookstore, and her latest book, On Girlhood, was published in 2021. And with that big ramble, I am turning this over to our moderator, who will get tonight's conversation started. Welcome, Glory. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here. And we're gonna start our conversation now. I will introduce everyone to the virtual stage. Welcome, Nick, Tony, and Jennifer. So, Thank you, Lori. We're excited to be here chatting with you tonight. Yes, we. this is going to be a wonderful conversation. And I, I have such immense respect for everyone on the panel. Your Yay. books are fantastic. I have them all in my lap here because I'm going to be referring to the pages as I ask you questions. But I think I want to start at the very, very beginning because something that struck me with each one of your titles is how um, intriguing they were, how each title felt like an invitation to just inquire more about what the word means when you write something like gun love or you have the word carry or you have the title dear martin each one felt like it symbolized it's something so much greater and i thought it'd be great to just talk about titles and what each title represented for each of you how about we start with uh jennifer would you like to talk about gun love sure um i guess there's, there's many reasons and complex things that are going on why it's called gun love that you will, that gets referred to throughout the book that, that becomes a more complex understanding of the title. But I mean, just cold seeing the title like this on the cover. I think for me, I was thinking of kinds of love. So mother love and this kind of love and that kind of love. And so I ended up thinking, um, gun love could be a kind of love. And so that is kind of echoed throughout in, in, in the book as a kind of metaphor in a way. So um, I guess that would be my answer. How about you, Nick? I mean, I wish mine was as like sweet and complex as that, but like I wrote about a book about a boy writing letters to a guy named Martin. And <laughs> it just, honestly, this is one of two books that I titled by myself because I am really bad at titling things. Um, but it has come to take on far more weight and meaning than my initial like, oh, well, he's writing letters to Martin, so we can just call it Dear Martin. Um, and I'm actually, I'm really thankful for the questions that get provoked by the title, because it's one of those things where you didn't think of any, you weren't like thinking anything of it when you created it, but it people make meaning out of it. And I think that's a beautiful thing. How about you, Tony? I know that there's an essay in the book with Carrie. Did you know immediately that essay would be the title of the collection? I did. The hard part was the subtitle. You know, we had I don't know, dozens of, of possible subtitles, you know, having to do more explicitly with guns, having to do more explicitly with violence against indigenous women. And so we settled, I always have to look because we had so many, a memoir of survival on stolen land is the subtitle. And I think that works because it is a book about how the founding, you have to go back to the founding of the country to reckon with our history with guns. Um, you know, the country was, was stolen land at gunpoint essentially. And so, so I felt like that, this subtitle work, but yeah, carry was always it. The, the wounds we carry, the guns we carry, concealed carry, campus carry, I teach on a campus, all those things. So it was always going to be the title. I have a hard time having a book come together, I think, until I know the title. So it was helpful to have it straight away. That's wonderful to know, just like the different responses from each of you and how you engage with the title. I am curious, we can continue with you, Tony. I'm curious to think about, um, you use a term in your book, the difference between everyday violence and extraordinary violence. And I was really, as I was like taking notes that, that held my attention because even this word extraordinary, I never think about it with the word 
violence, you know, but it's such a true thing, like how we categorize uh, these things that happened, whether it's domestic violence versus mass shootings, you know, these little microaggressions that we can encounter. Can you explain to the audience how you came to those two definitions? Yeah, for me, well, I think one example recently here in my community at a county fair, um, one person was shot um, and I, my daughter afterward and her friends were talking about whether it'd be safe to go the next day or not. And my daughter said, well, it was just one person. So one person being shot. Yeah. And she's not a callous kid at all, but she meant there are so many examples of extraordinary violence, right? Mass shootings, um, you know, school shootings, things that, things that make the big headlines. This was barely a blip. And then I had a friend respond to that who was there, who had her teenage girls there with her and their friends and was getting them to safety, trying to get them not stampeded and trampled over, right? Um, while everyone was fleeing because they'd all heard the shots. And so that's extraordinary, right? I think the things that we call every day really are extraordinary when we're speaking of gun violence. But what I'm trying to do by separating them out that way in the book is just to say, this is what we do. Um, even though gun violence is something we talk about in this house a lot, my daughter is even doing it, right? Saying, well, basically this is every day, every day someone's shot. And that's true. And that's terrifying. So what we, what we call out as extraordinary um, I think is, is to be put in question. It's all extraordinary. It's got to stay extraordinary if we're going to get anywhere. I saw Jennifer and Nick both react to your example. I'm curious to hear like, what were your immediate, for me, I'm just like, wow, that is surprising that we can find ways to normalize violence in that way. And it, as you said, it's not necessarily that your child is callous, but it's this this way that we see things continuously online in the media and it becomes, it minimizes it. I, I'm just curious to hear what the other two panelists were thinking when you heard that story. Um, so I'm gonna do my best not to cry. Y'all can probably hear my children. Welcome to life. life exactly. <laughs> they are loud and you embrace listen. it. But this story actually has to do with my children. Like hearing you talk, Tony, reminds me of, I was in the car with my children. This is shortly after the Uvalde shooting, right? And I hear them talking about death. And like, you know, most children are obsessed with death in some way or another. And I think we, we try to squash that out of them, but really we should just engage with it. However, this conversation going on in the back seat, I hear my younger son tell my older son, oh, I mean, well, you're gonna, you'll, you'll go to heaven before me. Basically just the idea that, well, you're older. So you're probably gonna die before I do. And my older son goes, well, you don't know that you might get shot. And like, even now I don't really have words and it's difficult to engage with children around the topic, around the topic of gun violence because frankly, what the hell do you say? You know, they are exposed to so much just because even if we don't say anything to them, they're having active shooter drills in schools. You know, like it's such, it's my, and it's mind blowing to me um, because it, they aren't callous. They are just adjusting to the world as it is. And I will say that as a mother, I hate it passionately. It, I, I feel for you in that same vein of just trying to understand how to communicate with young people when it comes to these horrendous acts that are happening without causing too much alarm, but also understand like this isn't normal, right? This shouldn't be your everyday. Um, I want to turn to you, Jennifer, because you had your characters are their mother, their daughter, there's all of that happening in gun love. And how do you take these, these stories that we're hearing and like put it inside of a, a novel and make it feel so heartfelt, so real. I was so impressed with your dialogue. Like I just felt like I was eavesdropping on a conversation in a lot of ways. Um, how did you find the, these characters and make them feel so real? And also the research, I'm really curious to hear the research you did to create the landscape and, and gun love. Yeah, well, just to, it ties into your, uh, previous question. So the reason that uh, Pearl is a young girl is because she doesn't know anything else. So that is what's so interesting about it was just one. 
because it's this acceptance, because this is just ordinary, if this is what you've grown up with. So for me, it was very important that that the character uh, just be matter of fact. And she tells everything in this matter of fact way, because she doesn't know that life can be any different. So, uh, so yeah, so um, now your second question about the research. Yeah, there was a the book is really a, a diptych. So um, Prayers for the Stolen is a book about how perhaps a Mexican girl might get to the United States and Gun Love is how an American girl might get to Mexico. Um, and one thing that's very important to me about um, Gun Love is that it is a lot about the guns going to Mexico and Central America, which is not really talked about that much in the United States. So the book is, yes, it's about violence in the United States, but it's also about the fact that um, there was a study at San Diego University that 48% uh, of all profits made from guns in the United States are made south of the border. I mean, if you look at Google map at the US-Mexican border on the US side, it's a wall of gun shops. So all this immigration coming to the United States, uh, fleeing from the violence of Central America and the violence of the drug violence um, in Mexico is fueled by US guns. Uh, and just today we had a massive massacre in where Prayers for the Stolen takes place and where in Gun Love, the Mexican was one of the gun runners. They're from this part of Mexico. And today we had a mass shooting in a, in a village. I think they already have said something like 22 dead. And I know, and we all know that, that those are US guns that came into Mexico. So a lot of research, I went to the NRA several times um, and visited the museum there, which is, um, fascinating. I could talk about that a lot. I've written about that. Uh, so yeah, but yes, a lot of research um, went into it. I would love to hear from Nick and Tony, the research for your process as well. Nick, I know that Dear Martin was inspired by the death of Jordan Davis. You shared that um, in, in other, you know, response to like the protests and um, the deaths of other young Black men. When you take those scenarios from real life and then you know pull them into your narratives, what research do you do per se to get like to make sure that it feels accurate, but it's also like in the vein of it's you know it's a, a fiction, it's still fiction, and young people can understand it. Yeah, so I do my best to fictionalize things to the point where I'm not being disrespectful to the to the survivor to the survivors and like the yeah. family of the people who've been killed but where it's undeniable that there's a link to something in current events current or past events because I my biggest thing when I'm writing about these tough topics especially topics around gun violence topics around um, police shootings. The biggest thing for me is making sure that nobody can ever tell me that I made something up or that this doesn't happen. I need to be able to point to something. So when I'm doing my research, I'm very careful about, you know, like a lot of the time I'm researching the family so that I'm not accidentally using any names, accidentally like pulling in details that would reopen a wound or like brush over a wound that's not healed. And the biggest, most important part of the research process for me is sitting down and talking with people who are like the people in the books, right? So like, I remember when I was writing both Dear Martin and Dear Justice. So I'm working on Dear Martin. I sat down and I had conversations with black boys, you know, between 15 and 18. And I talked to them about like, so are you nervous you're going to be stopped by the police at some point? How do you feel about the fact that like these boys are losing their lives and they haven't done anything wrong? And like just sitting down and getting to know them on a personal level was a really powerful experience. And the same thing with Dear Justice. I traveled the country for eight months visiting juvenile detention centers. And, you know, getting in the, into these very deep one-on-one -on -one conversations with these boys just to find out what their lives were like. That has been not only the most important part of my research process, but the part that keeps me going when it comes to writing these kinds of stories. Because unfortunately, this is stuff that's still happening. You know, there are still 
black boys and well really at this point more black men but they're still african-american people who are being gunned down by police in the midst of like unarmed and not really like doing anything necessarily wrong you know like we're still dealing with kids who are falsely accused of things we're still dealing with all of that so basically everything in these books is still recognizable and I am looking forward to the point when all of the research and everything that I did was great, but it's looked on as like something in the past, right? Like when I read Beloved, I'm thinking of, oh, dang, it, like I'm looking at it through the lens of the present and like, thank God there's no, there's no slavery now. And I don't have to do harm to my two-year-old to keep her from being sold into slavery. I'm looking forward to the day when this research and all of this work has helped to progress things to the point where it's looked at as historical fiction. I applaud each of you for having such diligence because that is so clear in your writing, like the research and the craft and the thoughtfulness that goes into telling these stories. And I want to pose the same question to you, Tony, because I, I mean, there was one essay in particular that um, I was just so taken with. I think it was give and go. I loved the, you know, the use of definitions. I get really obsessed with words and how you like broke down the, the word shooter. Like I, if there's, there's just so, each of you had such great ways of pulling the reader in and allowing them to engage, but also have, you know, start to question their own projections or their own biases, you know? So what was your process, Tony, when doing your research and trying to like bring this collection to its perfect space? Thanks for mentioning Give and Go. That's one of my favorites because it's about my childhood friend and her struggles um, as an adult. I mean, in part, it's about a lot of things, but yeah, I, I think that I tried when I sat down to envision the book, I knew I had certain incidents I wanted to write about, incidents of violence in my own life, um, incidents of violence in the communities I've lived in, you know, places I've lived in where police violence against unarmed people was really high or that had histories, like when I lived in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, you know, the American Indian movement was founded there because of police violence against indigenous people. And so, so I knew touch points in history and I knew contemporary incidents I wanted to write toward from places with which I'm familiar. I wasn't interested in going into neighborhoods and spaces and places where I've never spent any time. The Pittsburgh essay, I think, was the hardest to write because I was only there for a year. And my daughter was born there, so I felt some responsibility, you know, um, and there was record violence, gun violence in our neighborhood that year. Um, so there was, it was a happy time and it was a scary time in a lot of ways. And so that one was the hardest because I didn't know the place well. But for me, research was always guided by, do I know the place? Do I know the people? You know, am I from there enough to do this justice or am I willing to put in the time? So the time for me involved archival work and involved reading, but it mostly involved talking to people um, and going back through and then figuring out if we didn't remember things the same, what to do about that, right? Because there are a lot of family stories. And so, so that was a lot of my research. And then also looking through, you know, every town's gun statistics and other sources like that and coming up with, with the statistical research to back up what we all know is true anecdotally. So it was this sort of weaving together, but it was always in service of story, of knowing these stories from these communities and these places. Oh, I appreciate that sentence, to, to be in service of story. That feels like such a, um, the hallmark of being an author, that should be like your, your goal. Um, I want to turn the stage towards Jennifer again and talk to you about this idea of the work being a form of activism. I don't know why that struck me, um, especially as I was, even though this is fiction, I really felt like there was a story about how people can be threatened by violence, find themselves vulnerable in, in this unwitting way, become activists in in like in the story, do you consider your work a form of activism? And I'll pose this question to everyone, but when you're writing, when you're doing the research, do you consider it an act of activism? Or is it like Tony just said, it's really just in service of the story? Well, I guess, you know, um, I'm, I'm in service of the story and I'm looking for the language. I'm not looking to, about something. I'm looking to write almost always about something that 
that just really disturbs me or keeps me up at night or it just doesn't let me go. But saying that, I have to say that there's no doubt that novels especially have been places of great social change. And a novel can create tremendous social change. So, um, you know, especially uh, having been president of Penn International, I mean, one of the things we're very aware of is that the role of literature in, ch in change is very important. And of course, you know, they're very easy, huge examples in the English language. You know, Oliver Twist changed child labor laws and we don't remember the journalism journalism of that time, but you know the book helped uh, to change that practice. And there are so many examples like this. I mean, obviously Toni Morrison. I mean, she did amazing work in this. I mean, the list is long, so it does prove that that the importance of literature to create social change. So I don't go. I don't write it to hope that that happens. I write. I hope a good book. And then if something happens to create change, that's secondary. How about you, Nick? How do, how do you feel about that, uh, that infusion of activism in your work? And would you call yourself an activist? I mean, I don't know. Like, it's so inherent to my being as a person who is, you know, I think as a queer Black woman, everything I do has activism at its core just because everything I do is kind of an act of opposition to the status quo simply because I exist right um so what so what I will say is I do consider it a form of activism in the sense of the thought of activism as agitation based I think just by default, the things that I do have kind of an activist nature to them. My goal is always going to be making children feel seen um, and drawing attention to things that I think are deserving of critical thought, right? Like I will never be a person who tries to change people's minds, but I'm gonna do my best to give you something to think about maybe a little bit harder, you know? So to me, that is the core of, activism. Um, I once heard, I was in Philadelphia and I totally snuck into this event that ta Coates was having with a group of high schoolers. And he said on stage, activism is about agitation. And like, I will take that with me wherever I go, because to me, the flip is also true, right? Like if I am agitating, there's a good chance that there's some kind of activism going on based on what I'm writing. That's how I think of it. That's great. That's great. And, and now we'll turn to Tony. I think that I like that. I like the agitation model a lot and thinking about it, that your, your words on paper that go out into the world might cause some discomfort. I guess I think of it as discomfort. Um, I teach too. And I think of classrooms as spaces, not of comfort, but of, you know, profound discomfort and teaching people how to sit with some discomfort and and to think about things thoroughly and so I hope my work will do that um I don't as has already been said by other folks I don't necessarily set out to do that in my writing these are just the stories I'm drawn to um I would like I said I would write a puppies and flowers and kittens book next and that's not happening I'm not you know I, I try I think about it I write notes but I don't ever get past I think it's 249 words um, on the puppies and kittens kind of like lighter things. And then, I mean, that's not very far. That's not a book. And so these, this is just the work I want to do. And I don't see it necessarily as activism, but I would love it if it would spur people toward activism or, or make conversational space toward activism. I think of activism as things I did maybe more when I was younger or like my daughter does where you show up to a thing. Now I drive her and I bring the snacks because I'm middle-aged. Um, but those kids, you know, the way that people are out putting their bodies on the line sometimes, I think, or putting their bodies in a space, I guess I see that more as activism, but that's probably just my own hang up about growing older. It's probably not real. Probably writing is also activism, yes. I appreciate each one of you just sharing that with us because there is something about acknowledging that it can be 
it could be what you want it to be, right? So one person can take their pen and say, this is going to be something that's going to change the world politically. It could be part of my activism, my agitation, and another can turn and say, I want to provoke. I want to inspire. I want to help people feel, um, you know, strong enough and brave enough to like, to face that. So I really do appreciate that because it depends on who's holding the pen, you know, like they can decide that. Um, I'm going to go back to when I first got approached to do this uh, moderate, I was really taken by the title just to have guns, right? To like, no disclaimer, no, like, this is what we're going to talk about and join this conversation and see what that means. And so as I was reading, of course, I had the, that word in my forefront and I got to the last page of your book, Jennifer, and like, I'm going to read it to you all. Um, in my daydream, I lay among skeletons as gun parts where long femurs and ribs and ribs like the images in x-rays, x-rays of pieces of broken bodies broken. And I smelled gunpowder and maybe I smelled rust and blood and blood and rust and the souls of animals and the souls of people were all around me. And I heard a song of praise, applause. I heard pearl, 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 and congratulation. And I was just so, I mean, the, throughout the whole book, I was just really taken, but this last sentence when I was even like the, the gun parts, you know, like skeletons, like the, you, it became part of the body. And I was thinking of just like the political landscape now and how guns are so, they mean so much, they represent so much. It's like almost so they're part of our body, you know, they're like part of the American fabric, the American body. Um, and I wanted to hear you just like break apart this last page without giving spoilers. I know some people have read, some people have not, but when you were concluding this book, is that, what were you hoping would land with the reader with this very visceral description of like gun and the smell and the blood and just like all of the book feels this way. It feels like very intense, but I would love to hear you kind of break that last paragraph apart for us. Well, I think it's a little bit mysterious to me too, because everything that has happened before this moment. Uh, but I'm also on the board of an organization called SHOT which is one of the most extraordinary organizations. Um, and uh, basically we don't think about all the people that survive the shooting. And so we count the dead, but the people that survive are in such terrible, terrible, I mean, their lives are completely ruined and they're full of bullets and broken pieces of bones. And, and you know, so, you know, that really um, affects me very deeply that we don't talk enough about people that survive because they don't really survive. Um, and the other thing is that in Mexico, when the, the, the police um, capture you know, drug traffickers with tons of guns, one of the things they do is they break up the guns and use them to build roads. So like the roads are full of gun parts. So, I mean, I, I could talk about this for a long time, but it, it, the idea of gun parts and body parts and bones and rifles and, uh, is, is a theme that appears in, in quite a lot of my work. And I will turn that question to you, Nick, to think about how do you feel like guns show up or just like the, the collective memory of what it means to be have a gun? Because I, I know in college, I had a poster of Malcolm X against the wall with, you know, holding the gun. And that representation, I felt empowered and bold. And I had never touched a gun. I had never had any like a real experience with it. But when I saw Malcolm X holding it, it meant something different to me. And I felt proud of that image versus in another scenario when I see a gun and I feel threatened and afraid. So I would love to hear how, when you're talking about violence or guns or just like what that represents in, in your novels whether it's your justice or dear martin i feel like you just like read my soul out to everybody watching right now because like so you know dear martin is a book about a kid writing letters to the reverend dr martin luther king jr and he was a man who vowed to never have a gun like his house got firebombed and he was the, there there are there's this interview where he talks about considering getting a gun for the sake of protecting himself but he never did because he said to himself like I would rather be accepting of death 
then take this object into my hands that's able to bring about death, right? Like it was one of those things that really blew my mind because for my 21st birthday, my father took me to the firing range. So it's like this very, my dad is a retired police officer and that was his thing. Like you are going to know what, like I could tell you, oh, that's a nine millimeter Beretta. That's a 22 gauge. Like I can tell you all of these things, but I don't want to touch them either, right? And I find that, in the world that we live in today, I find myself very much, and I'm sure people are going to be like, oh my God, but like, I find myself very much understanding of people who cling to their, to their second amendment rights, right? I understand that. My father is one of those people. My dad growing up, y'all, my dad always, and he had an open carry license. So his gun was on him. He had a shoulder holster, holster that he carried around everywhere we went. He was a police officer, right? Even when he was in his regular clothes, he had his gun on him. So I've seen, and I understand, and I've done the research to dig into that culture because it is a culture. Where things get blurred is when you have people who are hurting, you know? It's like frequently there's a lack of, there's a lack of understanding of how powerful a gun can be and what a gun can do. And that's where things get fuzzy for me, right? Because I absolutely think that there should be really more intensive gun control laws. I absolutely believe that people should have to go through background checks. And I also recognize that like, it's been such an integral part of American, it's like in the foundations, it's in our founding documents, right? So it's something that I constantly vacillate about. Every time there's a mass shooting, I weep. My, one of my very best friends was killed in the Pulse Massacre in Orlando. And I remember, I vividly remember the panic of calling him and him not answering the phone, right? I remember texting and not getting a response. And then the next morning I was literally was sitting in my mother's driveway. I pulled my car into my mother's carport at her townhouse and I saw his name on the list. They, had, they released the names of the victims. And I, I will never forget that moment, right? And I also recognize that there are people who have been saved by a gun. Like it's all so complex. And I think that the best thing that we can do for ourselves is make sure we get an understanding of as much of it as possible before forming an opinion. And then when you do form an opinion, not imposing that opinion on other people, right? Like that's the beauty of being a person, especially a person in this like very individualistic culture that we are a part of, we get to decide how we feel about things. I just want people to be very, very careful and very cognizant and very deliberate about the things that they engage with before making their decisions. I don't even know if I answered your question, but you I'll did. Step you off, did. I'll you step offered... off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. I, I appreciate you sharing that with us. And we're going to turn it to Tony as well, because I'm I am very curious to hear your description of, of what it means to have a gun in, in American culture and how, and what it represents, you know, like I, between Jennifer and Nick, they've both shared different representations and different ideas. And I'm really curious to hear your take on that. Yeah, I grew up in a house with guns too, a lot of guns. My dad had five brothers and they were all were, I mean, several of them were law enforcement, several of them had been in the military, they all grew up hunting. And so I grew up in a really rural area and now I live in a slightly more urbanized part of the South, but it's still gun culture. I have, I don't know that I've ever lived anywhere that wasn't really deeply steeped in gun culture. So it's the same, it's the same as growing up, I think in sports culture, in a way, you know, the names of things, you know what they look like, you can name them. Um, on the other hand though, you know, it's killing us, right? I mean, this culture, we have to think about it. We have to interrogate it. We have to break it down. I also grew up in a house, so I grew up in a house with a lot of guns and I grew up in a house with domestic violence. And we have to address the correlation between, you know, gun ownership and domestic violence, between gun ownership and taking those guns outside the house, as I talk about a lot in Carrie and what happens next. 
um, most mass shooters, statistically speaking, have a record of domestic violence. And so, you know, we have to talk about these interrelated social problems. And I see gun culture as a social problem, right? Like how we don't, how we don't openly discuss it, that and domestic violence, how they're things that get swept under the rug. Um, they're not serving us well so far. And yet also, I had an uncle who passed away a year or two ago who had a gun. He lived up in Northern Minnesota. Um, he was getting around by golf cart or by cane and he had his gun in case he came upon a bear in the woods. Do I think he needed that gun? Do I think he would have been able to kill a bear with it? I don't know, maybe, right? But I understand that at his age, you know, he's gonna hang on to that gun. And it would have been very difficult for any of us to have talked him out of it, though some of us tried. And so there are those people and I have empathy for them. Um, yeah, and I have, I have relationships with lots of them. So I think it's a complex issue. It's not easy, but it's a worthwhile conversation and we're not getting anywhere but being quiet about it. Yeah. And I think that's the value of having spaces like this one where we can engage and use mm -hmm. literature and books as a, a way to kind of navigate through the difficult conversations or the add nuance to it, where sometimes people can be really black and white as if it's like guns or no guns and there's nothing in between. So I appreciate all the different examples of how these things can really show up in real life. They can show up in our policy making. Um, in our everyday homes. Uh, and it's not just this one isolated case. It, it requires you to interrogate and to be very mindful of how people live their lives. Um, the next question I would love to talk to everyone about is I'm leaning more into the, the craft of each one of your books. And I am completely obsessed with revision and you know what is left out of a book at times. And each of you have, I feel like it was, was so carefully crafted in terms of like sentence structure or even the length of the book. I am a fan of a book that is under 250 pages. <laughs> That's like the perfect number. You know, you could do that. And on a good rainy day, you can do it in a whole day, <laughs> you know, such a good amount. But when I see that number, I always recognize like what is left out, right? So I'm sure there was so much left on the cutting room floor. I want to take it to Jennifer because I was really curious on your process of putting the characters, developing your characters and who, what was left out, like working with your editor. Is that something you could divulge a little bit? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't really have a sense of what was left out. Um, I guess I am very spare. So one of the problems that I always have when I write is that I, I write 10 words and then I cut 30. So, so I'm always like climbing backward. I can never really climb forward. So it's, it's hard because of the way that I write. It's, it's, it's a, it's a very poetic prose, but what I can say is that certainly in gun love, Again, the title, back to just the first question, is that for me, gun love is really like a, ba a, 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 a ballad. It's like a great long song to me. Like even the opening line of the first time I heard Pearl's voice and she said, uh, my mother was a cup of sugar. You could borrow her anytime. And I can hear in my head the guitar, you know, you know, <laughs> and so the whole the whole book, I just hear the music the whole time and it's full of music. So no, I, I, I'm, I don't have a sense of having taken something out. I mean, there were certain things that were very important that I knew had to be there. For example, a lot of people think that the book takes place in Florida because I care that it takes place in Florida. I don't. The only reason it takes place in Florida is I wanted to get to Corpus Christi, Texas because I wanted to talk about Selena Quintanilla, who was shot and killed, and, and who I love. And so all of that trajectory was really to be able to get there. And also I wanted her to cross into Mexico at the Lincoln Benito Juarez Bridge, you know, because that's a very symbolic bridge. And so, and also that it's surrounded by tremendous um, gun shops, that whole area. So that was more important to me, the story of Selena, than the fact that it was in Florida. So, but it to cutting, I can't really think of like what I was, what I cut exactly. I, 
I highlighted that first line too. Like between like the beginning and your end, I was like, oh, she is, did she do an MFA in poetry as well? Like this is so, <laughs> so stunning. It was, it did feel very ly- lyrical. So adding that ballad, like I, I read that, I totally felt that. I'm going to turn it to Nick. Like what was, the, was there anything that you left or you wanted to, that you added in to your justice the next time? What was the editing process like for you? I had like the whole opposite experience of Jennifer. Like I cut Dear Martin in half. It was the original draft of this book was 79,000 words. It had eight points of view. It was nonlinear. Like it was the same book, but completely differently told. And you have a play that we're going to, we're going to see later. (laughs) Listen, And I mean, like I cut 40,000 words from this. I cut a book from this book and I, and like, it sucked. It was the one of the, it was like the number two worst writing experience I've ever had largely. Be, it just, just because it was such hard work. Um, I did it again recently. Uh, my, I have a book coming out in February that I recently cut in half. And I think that like, for me, I'm really glad for everything that got left on the cutting floor. Well, there's a couple of things that I'm like, dang, I was doing such a good job of cutting. I, maybe should have fleshed this part out a little bit more. I should have left a little more of this, a little more of that. But I do think that, so my editor read the initial draft of Dear Martin and said, basically was like, nope. And I was like, what do you mean, nope? (laughs) Like, what do you even say to that, right? But she had bought it on proposal. So like I sold my debut novel on proposal. I do not recommend this to anyone because once you sell something on proposal, your editor knows what they're looking for and you will have to kind of like fall in line. Um, So, but she had some really excellent points, right? The cuts that I made, it simplified the book. It streamlined it. It made it like one single point of view. And her goal was to appeal to what I call high taste readers. Um, There are people who refer to certain kids as reluctant readers. I'm like, no, they're not reluctant. They just don't want to be bored. So they have higher tastes than the people who are okay with being bored, I guess, right? Like it's just, it's a, a rhetoric trick to make these kids feel good about themselves. But she was right. Me cutting the book, it's, a, it's 208 pages, cutting it in half and simplifying it. Kids get hooked in instantly. And like, and now I, I, I refuse to write a book that's longer than 45,000 words. <laughs> Good for you. It I, is I, great. I, I, adults also appreciate that. <laughs> what about you, Tony? There, the book started for me as this document. I mean, I had a few essays written, but I had a document called Waiting for the List of Names. And it was when I was waiting after the shooting in Orlando at Pulse Nightclub, because I taught there. And so that document grew and grew and grew and grew. It was just all, all the sort of interconnected violences, right? And so I had all these incidences from my life and from the lives of the people I was waiting on hearing if they were still with us. And a lot of that did not make it into the book, but I wrote it. So uh, yeah, Carrie probably is double its size if we went back and took every, I called them extra files, every extra file, every chapter had at least two extra files, except for um, maybe the kingdom in Arizona only had one because I knew that story and where it was going straight away. But uh, Lubbock, Texas, I've got three or four pieces on Lubbock because Lubbock, Lubbock's a high crime, high violence sort of place. And it's a place I love. I lived there a long time. I've got a lot of Lubbock pieces that maybe I'll do something with, you know, at some point. Uh, but yeah, my editor, I sold my book on proposal too. And they do, they have an idea of what they think belongs she took out a lot of the sports and that made me sad but other than that I felt like there's not as much basketball in this book as there was um but that can be for another book right I mean you know yeah yeah but anyway yeah no I think that it was mostly personal incidences you can't it's a very sad book if you include every single thing also and there had to be room for beauty and imagery and lightness and the full complexity of other people's stories. So I don't regret any of the cutting, except there was more about Russell Westbrook in the first book and the give and go essay. And I do regret those cuts, but otherwise, no, I don't regret any of it. Shout out. <laughs> I, um, we're almost, we're gonna open it up to Q and A. So if you have a question and as you're watching in the audience, please place your question in the Q and A, the chat box at the bottom of the screen. 
I, another thing that I really enjoy doing after I read a book, I have a extra file. I like, I like that reference where I like to think about um, the, the books, how they're in conversation with other things that I'm reading. Like if it makes me think of a particular short story or another character and how they could be in relation, especially when it comes to like historical fiction and then something contemporary. I like to really think about putting those things against each other. And I would love to hear from each of you what, who your uh, characters or who, who your books are in conversation with. Like if there was going to be like a book pile and they were all together as one, um, are there any titles or authors that come to mind? Who would like to start? I can. I mean, like, I feel like there's a group of us, me, Jason Reynolds, Angie Thomas. Um, oh man, why am I blanking on names? This is terrible. Uh, but like, there's a, there's like a handful, Marco Shiro is a really great example. There's a handful of us that wrote these books about really police misconduct and gun violence that it's like gun violence and also gun violence perpetuated on oppressed peoples by people who are in the position to be oppressive. And I think that that those books, The Hate You Give, um, All American Boys, uh, Anger is a Gift is a really great one. Like there are so many of these books that you're getting a similar story, but from these very different perspectives. And I love that. I think that that's a really important thing. How about you, Jennifer? I don't know. It's I hadn't had I haven't really thought about that question. So I, I'm sort of caught off guard of thinking who who with whom the book would sit. I mean, certainly, you know, there's a lot of song lyric. So I was checking out a lot, a lot of songs and songs written about guns and and things like that to sort of get this feeling. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's a weird thing to say, but the book is in complete con conversation with a previous book of mine, with Prayers for the Stolen. I mean, you could literally stitch a tapestry between these two books. So, you know, certainly it would have to sit with that book, but it is my own book. Uh, so I guess what comes to mind uh, is would really, I think, be song lyrics. How about you, Tony? I was reading a lot of poetry when I wrote Carrie, and I do still read a lot of poetry. And so I feel like probably Natalie Diaz, her book, When My Brother Was an Aztec, um, Cassandra Lopez, Brother Bullet. Erica Meitner's book, I think, came out slightly after mine. Um, it's Holy Moly, Carry Me, and it's about gun violence. She teaches at Virginia Tech. And that book in particular the breadth of it because it's about family and motherhood too and Cassie's uh, brother bullet is as well well they all are really and so probably those books because they're in conversation about land and who you belong to who belongs to you um, as well as guns and gun violence and maybe also the wizard the roundhouse too because it's about violence and not so much about guns but about land place and policy and violence so those might those might be the ones yeah, that's great. That's great. It's always awesome to hear that. And then afterwards you can, and Jennifer, in your case, we can make a playlist of songs and we can create different like curated reading lists. So people can know that once they're even, I mean, naturally this conversation, I feel like all of your books are in conversation with one another, have the central theme around how we can in some ways overcome this, the stigma around not talking about gun violence, you know, cause that's another thing where it can become, the conversation can come very didactic and it's like you're lecturing to people about that you should do this versus you should do that versus like, let's have a really thoughtful, intentional conversation about how this changes communities, how this impacts families, how people, are lost from the violence, but how some people remain in their, you know, their lives traumatically change, um, which is like a conversation that I see. I'm a member of um, 
different coalitions and I donate to a lot of different organizations, it's including every town, uh, because I want there to be more conversations and more safe spaces. Um, I think my next question is going to really uh, be around more of like the emotional tenor of what it means to write about these subjects. How did you all, because again, each one, they're, they're dense in subject. They can be traumatic. Tony, you've mentioned that you talked about the experiences you had as a child and, um, you know, with losing your friends, domestic violence. How did you each take care of yourselves as you were writing such intense topics? And was there a ritual or, or practice you had to pull yourself out of it and like just place yourself in, in your like real world again as you were writing about these things? If you don't mind, we can start with you, Tony. Yeah. One thing I did that I don't regret for the most part is I got a great big dog and petting. I mean, she's she was 100 pounds when we got her and she was underfed and she's very soft. And so I think having an animal to pet was um, was the sort of I mean, people talk about elaborate self-care rituals and I never know what to make of any of that. I admire it kind of. I'm a little skeptical. Um, I got a dog and I pet her. Now she's 137 pounds. Uh, she was really underweight. And so so she remains, that remains, you know, kind of happy to have her. I cooked a lot. I had, uh, as far as taking care of myself, I took care of the book too, and the people in the book, if that makes sense, and showed them care. I had, I we've moved since then, but I had it right next to my writing desk back then. Um, more love songs, more candy. So just making sure everybody was taken care of in the book, that they got the full picture of themselves put forward, you know, all of the, what kind of candy did they like to eat? What love songs did they like? Or, you know, that kind of thing. So I tried to do that for myself, but probably I'm better at doing it for the people in the book than for myself. It was a long decompression period after I handed it in. That's, that's great. How about you, Nick? I was terrible um, about take, like, I didn't take care of myself at all while working on Dear Martin and really like, the six or seven books after that. Like I just went really, really, really hard for four years or so. Fabulous. See, Dear Martin came out in 2017. So October 17th will be like the five-year anniversary of the book. And it's this year that I like looked at myself and said, if you don't sit down somewhere and take a breath. So like now I'm really great at self-care with like, my very bourgeois monthly facials and, you know, every 10 days I get a manicure and pedicure. I mean, and these are things that I'm able to do because I went so hard for so long. So it's like a real conflict. I have a real complicated relationship with work to be completely honest. And I'm still trying to figure it out, but the way that I came out and really the way that I stayed buoyed while working on Dear Martin was that I looked at the people I was writing it for, which were my two little boys. Um, so my son, Kieran is 10, Milo is six. He wasn't born when I initially, Milo was not born when I wrote Dear Martin. I got pregnant um, the fall after I wrote the first draft. And so, yeah, like I, I actually found, I found Dear Martin in my 10 year old's iPad case the other day. And I said, you put this in here? And he like got very shy and like embarrassed. And he told me that he had. And I said, did you read it? And he apparently read the whole thing last week. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? And he said that he didn't tell me because he was embarrassed and he was embarrassed because he didn't like it. So here we are friends. <laughs> But it's I, always your own kids. So I'm like, I wrote it for you. What you mean? <laughs> and I asked, I was like, so you're going to read Dear Justice now? He's like, well, since I did like Dear Martin, I decided to read New Kid instead. I was like, okay. <laughs> <New kid. laughs> so my reason for continuing to go didn't actually like the product, but that's totally fine. Because I mean, he, can, he should life. revisit when he's like 16, you know, yeah, maybe. Like when you're older, maybe you'll like it better. It's paying for your private school right now. So there you go. <laughs> There you go. That is, oh, that's good entertainment. Oh, the, the qualms of being a parent. That's hilarious. How about you, Jennifer? I, especially with the travel, it seems like you travel quite a bit to get the, the 
all the details and make sure, you know, you mentioned the gun shops on the border and the museum. How do you keep yourself grounded as you're doing this very intense like research and um, building these worlds? I don't know. I mean, it's one thing I can say is what I do need is to be alone. So even when I had little children, um, I would go and spend a couple of days in a hotel room because I need uh, almost to be living the book um, in a very intense way and to have any kind of outside uh, things going on, I find it really difficult. So there's all this process of finding um, time to be completely alone. And certainly there are times when I have to read the whole book from start to finish over a few days and hold the book and I can't have any interruptions or anything. I mean, and when I'm writing, I'm always kind of in a, in a state of schizophrenia because I always feel like I'm in two worlds. I'm in this world that we're having now, but the other world is always there and very often stronger the other world. I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's a strange thing. But in, uh, but I do, I do want to um, address what Tony said because um, uh, I'm very careful to never put my characters in a situation in which they lose their dignity. So already just everything is a loss of dignity. So I do not want that my writing uh, contribute to that. So, you know, I will never write a rape scene or things like that. So for example, in Prayers for the Stolen, when she describes this gang rape that 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 happens to her, she says, you know, what can I tell you? I was like a plastic water bottle that everybody took a swig of. You know, that's the door that I will go in through. So I'm always making sure that that because of language, um, I'm preserving the dignity of my character. I feel, and there's a moment in the book where I really fall in love with everybody. And that's when I know it's working because I feel protective. I feel like a, a, a lioness about them all, you know. That's brilliant. That's so brilliant. That protective nature that happens as an author, or someone you just want to protect your characters. I thank you for sharing that. We're going to turn to, we have some really incredible questions also um, that we're going to turn to in the chat. So again, if you have more questions, if you have anything you want to share with the authors, please place it in the chat and I'll read them out loud. Um, this first one, we're going to turn back to this topic of uh, guns and mass shootings and all these things that are happening in our society. And so this question is regards the world record for mass shooting. The U.S. holds the world record for mass shootings more than one in every day of the year. Hundreds and hundreds of people dead and wounded. It is hard for those of us in other countries to understand why Americans tolerate this death toll. What do you think it will take to de-escalate gun culture in the U.S. and thus in the border countries that, su countries that suffer the consequences too of this culture? Um, and if you don't mind, I, I, Jennifer, you if you would take that question first, given your the nature of your book and the fact that you like really focused on the border countries um, with gun love. What do you think of that with us holding the world record for mass shootings? Is there anything that would provoke gun culture de-escalating? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, I I keep thinking this is the this is the thing that will change everything. Every time something terrible happens, I think, oh yeah, this is the one. And then everything just keeps going normally. And then another terrible thing happens, and you think, oh okay, this is the one that's going to change everything. And so what I've sort of come to realize in this kind of, you know, very fatalistic way is that we have not yet seen what is going to make things change. And that just fills me with horror, is the truth. Uh, also, we haven't really talked, I mean, we've talked about, you know, the, the Second Amendment a little bit, but Going to the museum, I found very disturbing. And I went back several times because I was trying to understand this infatuation and worship, I would call, of guns. Uh, the essay that I wrote about it is called um, The Church of Gun because uh, actually the museum is set up 
like a church with chapels and with sort of like an altar in the front. And in each chapel, there were all these things to guns. So, you know, there would be like the president's gun in one and um, a boy's room from the 1950s with all his sort of, you know, red flannel bed and his little toy BB guns. And then there'd be one about the game of killing game in Africa, those great guns and uh, the guns of Hollywood. So it's another chapel with, you know, all those guns of all those people. And at the end of the sort of museum, there was a gun in the middle all by itself that had an, an eternal flame under it. Yes, exactly. And it was completely melted. And it was a gun that was found in the rubble of 9-11. And then you go into the museum shop and you can buy a little pink bib for a little girl baby that says NRA on it. You know, I mean, it's just like, what is this? I just find it very, um, very disturbing. What are your thoughts, Tony, Nick? That museum is really something. I've been there too. It does feel like a church. You're not at all wrong about that. I agree. Um, it's a surreal experience. A lot of diving into the fashion of gun culture and the particulars of, of you know, it's a monetized, commercialized system um, in so many ways. There's so many accessories and all of that to be fascinating. But it, I think sometimes it helps us to go back rather than to go forward or imagine going forward. And in the you know, until the Reagan years, the NRA was not, did not have a lobbying arm, was not a political entity, was a sporting organization. And the Reagan years are within my lifetime. And that's not, you know, that's not that long ago historically. So if we can go so far away from the culture we had then to the culture we have now in that short amount of time, what can we do in a similar time frame going forward, right? Um, and so maybe there's some hope in that, maybe there's some hope or it's going to have to be legislated and that is going to be ugly for everyone um, and difficult, but it's gonna have to be some combination of just a major shift from these, these next generations. And I hate to put more things on their shoulders. We already are putting climate crisis on their shoulders, right? But but I think it's gonna have to be a going forward and a looking back what was happening in the years pre-Ronald Reagan era where we had a different kind of culture, literally around guns. And how did we allow the NRA to shift things so dramatically? And how can we shift back? Um, I think those are, those are the questions I have. Yeah. As you said that, I was like, the, the internet, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. like <laughs> definitely yeah. part of the, the, the issue. Um, I'm curious to hear what you think too, Nick. What Jennifer said really resonated and I hate that it did, but I think that you have such a, you just made such a powerful point. I think about the civil rights movement and the turning points in, you know, the legislation that led to desegregation, ending Jim Crow, um, even the fact that like it took the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. being shot for a whole slew of legislation to get passed. It's almost like out of this guilt that people were feeling over the death of this man, you know? And I, I remember when I was doing research for Dear Martin, reading about nonviolence as a tactic to accomplish social change and how really the goal of nonviolence is to appeal to people's consciences but the only way that that happens is when things get so grotesque that nobody can turn away and I feel exactly like exactly what Jennifer said is like and I, I find that terrifying like what is it going to take for people to say you know it's like you have these incidents where small children are murdered in their classrooms at school and the solution that is proposed is to arm the teachers and I'm just like but I don't understand <laughs> like and I say this even as a person who when it comes to gun culture like I have you know I've done a pretty decent deep dive into gun culture but it's almost like at what point do we recognize that these 
things that make people feel powerful are also being used in ways that take away other people's power, right? Like at some point there's got to be some kind of a reckoning and I'm hoping, I don't know, it's scary. Just like Jennifer said. Would I would flip that question on its head a bit to say, and, and this is actually a question from one of the watchers out there. Thank you for everyone for being here with us. What gives you all hope? You know, on the opposite side of the things that are terrifying and just feel heavy and like they, there's like no lights. What is what? What keeps you hopeful to keep writing to stay consistent with the the work that you're doing um, and allowing it to really flourish despite the the obstacles that are ahead? I mean, when it comes down to it, like I'm still here. If that's not yeah. reason enough for hope, I don't know what is, right? Like, I also look back, you know, I'm a person who loves digging into history to see, to see what things were like. Like we are frequently, because this is the reality that we live in and it is unprecedented in every way. Like everything that we are experiencing has literally never happened before in the way that it's happening. And what's helpful to me is to look back at times when things were different. Sometimes those things were worse. Like studying the civil rights movement actually gives me a lot of hope. Even when it comes down to things like banned books, right? Like the fact that people are banning books while on the one hand is a little scary. It's also a sign that we've progressed in a way that people are ruffled about the fact that they're, they're ruffled about the changes that are happening, right? So like my hope really is rooted in my continued existence. It's rooted in the beauty of my sweet little children who sometimes are not very sweet at all. Um, I just, I think that there's always some kind of light. And like, when I zoom out, you know, we are on this speck of a planet in this very wide solar system that's situated in what we know of as one universe there could be more of them like just thinking about scale is also something that I find super helpful because it's like okay so what thing can I do to make somebody's life less miserable today and sometimes that just has to be enough thank you so much for that I, I appreciate that how about you Tony in the course of writing the book and in continuing to do writing on this topic, I meet so many people whose lives have been so much harder than mine and who've been touched more directly by guns and gun violence and they have hope. And if they can walk around trying to enact change and be hopeful, then, then I should probably get dressed and go to work, you know? So I feel like the showing up for each other, the carrying each other's lives for it and our stories for it. And yeah, I think it's absolutely right. We're still here and that's to be celebrated. After the last few years, I can't imagine not celebrating that. So, so that's what gives me hope. And you, Jennifer? No, I think I have a similar answer. I mean, for me, uh, I've had the incredible privilege to meet some of the bravest, bravest people in the world. You know, people who have given up uh, their livelihood, their homeland, their family, and often given their lives for the to defend the truth, for the telling of the truth. And so I'm just sort of always in awe of all these people. And, and through the pen work, I've met uh, these brave souls all over the world, and they fill me with hope. And, and uh, it's just amazing to see that kind of um, bravery, really. I, you know, I am so, I was so excited to talk to you each that there is a portion of reading that we were supposed <laughs> to do. <laughs> and I want to invite, um, maybe we just do a snippet, maybe two or three sentences from each person's book. I did read a, a piece from Gun Love that I loved. I would love to hear another sentence or two from you, Jennifer. If each of you could read a couple of sentences and give some context to it. Um, how about you, we start off with you, Nick, from Dear Martin. Is there a few sentences you can share and give people a taste of your beautiful writing? 
you are far too kind. And also I'm like, this should be interesting because this is the book that is very much in the voice of like a 17 year old black boy. So beautiful writing might be a stretch to some people who are watching. Um, but yeah, no, I absolutely will. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna read from a letter. So in this book, for those who are not familiar, the main character, his name is Justice. He gets racially profiled in the opening chapter. So he starts this journal of letters that he writes to the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. really to see how Dr. King's teachings are, will hold up today as he's facing, he's literally facing racism on a daily basis, right? So this is one of the letters that he writes after he gets into a fight. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, Dear Martin, you know, I don't get how you did it. Just being straight up. Every day I walk through the halls of that elitist ass school. I feel like I don't belong there. And every time Jared or one of them opens their damn mouth, I'm reminded they agree. Every time I turn on the news and see another black person gunned down, I'm reminded that people look at me and see a threat instead of a human being. There was some white dude on TV after the Tavarius Jenkins things broke, the Tavarius Jenkins thing broke talking about how cases like his and Shamar Carson's deflect from the issue of black on black crime. But how are black people supposed to know how to treat each other with respect when since we were brought over here, we've been told we're not respectable. What the hell are we supposed to do, Martin? What am I supposed to do? Be like Manny and act like there's nothing wrong with a white dude asking his niggas to help him exploit a black girl? Do I just take what they dish out, try to stop being so sensitive? What do I do when my very identity is being mocked by people who refuse to admit there's a problem? I know I did the wrong thing tonight, but right now I can't find it in me to be remorseful. Those assholes can't seem to care about being offensive. So why should I give a damn about being agreeable? I gotta say, I've been reading your sermons and studying your books for six months now. And it feels like all I have to show for it is frustration and a sense of defeat. I swear I heard, I heard some girl ask, why are black people so angry all the time as I left Blake's house? But how else am I supposed to feel? My hand hurts, I'm going to bed. JM. <laughs> Listen, I appreciate your writing because I was that 17 year old writing letters. It wasn't to Dear Martin. I was obsessed with Nanny Barrows. I don't know if anyone knows who that is. Please look her up. Yeah. And she's from Washington DC and I, I just, I used to write letters all the time as a 16 yeah. year old to a 17 year old. Sometimes they would get mailed out. Sometimes they would just sit in my, you know, my journal. And it sounded a lot like that. Just like yeah. trying to process and understand who I am in the space when I'm not always welcomed and appreciated. So thank you for that. Yeah. Tony, would you like to read some, um, something from Carrie, if you would give us an introduction to which essay and give us some context, that would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I am going to read just a little snippet from the City Beautiful essay, which is about Orlando. Um, that's the section that I decided on. And it's, uh, so the, the shooting at Pulse Nightclub, that neighborhood is one I know well. And I kept thinking, um, Omar Mateen trained, got his weapons training at G4S. Uh, when he was an employee there. And G4S were the same security organization group that took the dogs and the rubber bullets to Standing Rock. And so, you know, the, the ways in which these things are connected really struck me. And I also kept thinking about place and about neighborhood and how that's not a walking neighborhood so much. Where Pulse was, it's a, a driving neighborhood. And so I was thinking about all the cars and all the people who would have to come and pick up the cars. Um, in the days after, so I'll read that section. How do you enter that car? How do you collect yourself for that drive home? How do you make your knees fold like they're meant to or use or your hands hold the key? What I want for everyone there is to have the will to do this everyday regular act under these terrible irregular circumstances. What I want is for everyone all across this, our America, to say no more to say this will be the last time anyone will have to make a drive like this, to say this will be the last time anyone will have to feel the weight of holding those keys. Thank you so much. And we're gonna close with Jennifer, if you can read some from Gun Love, um, a beautiful sentence, a ballad to us. 
Okay, so Pearl is watching how her mother is falling in love, crazy falling in love with the wrong guy. And she says, um, now that my mother was loving Eli, she was tasting him deep and only getting a wishing well kind of hunger. She'd never be full again. When Eli left and I was back in the car, I watched as she licked the inside of her palms for his taste like a kitten. At night, she slept wearing one of Eli's shirts and moved around fretfully in her sleep. If my mother had watched another woman in this condition, she would have had the diagnosis in a second. My mother would have said, Pearl, it's like that song. She's asking for water, but he's giving her gasoline. Every, everyone's nodding. We're like, we are there. <laughs> so perfect. So absolutely perfect. I want to give a deep, deep thank you to you all for sharing your stories with us, having this incredible conversation. I'm going to now turn it over to Penn Faulkner. Carolyn is going to come on to the virtual stage. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Glory. Um, like Glory said, my name is Caroline Schreiber. I'm Penn Faulkner's Director of Development. Um, I want to thank all of our authors, Echo Glory's thanks to them for being here tonight, for sharing their perspectives on this very intense issue. I'm so glad you all were able to join us and so glad you got to read from your books here at the end. <laughs> I think the event would not have been complete without it, so thank you. I also want to thank everybody watching at home for attending and for supporting programs like this one. If you're not yet a Penn Faulkner donor, I invite you to become one tonight. Uh, your support helps to fund programs like tonight's conversation, as well as our education programs, which serve thousands of students at Title I schools all across DC, and of course, our annual awards celebrating the very best in contemporary fiction. If you enjoyed tonight's conversation, we'd also like you to join us for our upcoming Literary State of the Union event. That'll be held on Friday, October 21st at the Willard Hotel here in DC. Uh, it'll be a big party, including an open bar, dinner, dessert, the chance to mix and mingle and connect with 21 of your favorite local DC authors. $75 tickets are available now, and I believe there's a link in the chat that Alina has added. So we hope to see you there if you're available later this month. Thank you all again for attending tonight. We hope to see you again very soon. Have a great night. Be safe.